We showed uh, at the beginning last week and at the beginning this week an illustration from a book on Chaucer. And the illustration that was shown is this major highway in England of 800 years ago. Just to let you know that the Canterbury Pilgrims did not go down I-5. <laughs> It's important because uh, in this photo, that grassy path was what was a highway in late medieval times. The only roads before the 1900s that anyone would have recognized as really roads were major Roman roads. The Appian Way, the Via Flamenia, the major Roman roads were always wide enough that they would be comparable to uh, roughly a two-lane highway today, a little bit narrower than that. They were paved, and they had curbs, and they had milestones. And each milestone did not measure the distance to the next place or to some other place. Each milestone, wherever it was in the Roman Empire, measured how far it was to the center of Rome. So that you knew at all times where you were in terms of the power. And in the Roman Forum, there was a marker, which was the center of all the roads in the world. And all the measurements came from there. Now this kind of stricture broke down and it broke down in the late 500s, the late 6th century. And so this photograph of a road in Chaucer's day in the late 1300s, some 700 years after the Roman order had broken down, shows that there was no reconstruction of the Roman empirical structure in life. That reconstruction of the Roman imperial ethos was a product of the age of um, revolution. Napoleon's troops dressed themselves like the equis, the knights, the Roman knights, with the capes and the helmets, and they imagined that they were reconstructing the Roman Empire where very quietly the people who built them were constructing the Roman Empire, the British. And the British Empire, indeed, was very much like a Roman Empire. All of this has to do with art, because all of this has to do with the quality of experience. And the basic issue in art is the question of experience. What is experience? And largely, for an uncritical person, experience is a matter of your emotion with a subtext of feeling. So that emotion as a powerful nexus and feeling as the kind of um, commentarial subtext. And generally, in uncritical people, the ego acts as the central milestone. All emotion and all feeling are in terms of this central pillar which the ego holds in itself. And so all experience generally for most human beings is a matter which is already preconditioned to such an extent that uh, it's, in, it's inaccessible. That is to say, not only is the feeling inaccessible in its actuality, but the emotional nexus is inaccessible in its actuality. And both of those are covered by a structure which has been imposed several thousand years ago, which is also inaccessible. And so most people 
live in an area which we could characterize by the metaphor of muddy water over a series of sediments that cover the actual foundation of their, what shall we say, true nature? In this scenario, with this metaphor, no art exists. No art is possible. Because the other term that we need to consider, which is essential for art, is expression. Expression. Experience must be able to express itself in personal terms for there to be a chance for art. And this is very easy to say, it's very difficult to understand, and it's almost beyond touch to be able to prove. So what I'm going to try today is to engender enough of a background so that you on your own can sort out for yourself these very crucial, this very crucial pair, these very crucial ideas, experience and expression. Now we might say, uh, some of you who have been going through this education continuously, that there is an idea of experience, there is an idea of expression, and both can be brought together symbolically. And when they're symbolized, they're much easier to handle. But in order to symbolize the idea of experience or the idea of expression, there has to be an integral patterning which allows for enough condensation which is only possible through composition, enough condensation so that you can get below and underneath this muddy water and these sediments and come into actual contact with uh, real materia. The real materia being the actuality of nature, the practicality of your existence, and the generative quality of your experience. Once you're in possession of those three, and there's some kind of sequentiality that's uh, available, and some kind of composition, then the integration can proceed to a point to where one can come to the idea. And once the idea has come to, then you can have that um, transformation that happens with a powerful symbol and be able to begin to see. And out of that beginning seeing comes the ability to recognize expression and there for the first time is art. So this is a complicated process in some respects, simple in other respects. I'm going to give you a little bit of a contrast here and then we're going to go to John Dewey. The contrast I want to do is a contrast between myth and art. And it's very important because myth is extremely a country cousin to art. Or, on the other hand, art is a city cousin to myth. They're very similar. Now, the very first person in world literature to ever hold myth and art in both hands, equally, was Homer. And Homer's Iliad is the all-time champion. It's the pioneering work that for the very first time holds myth and art equally in two hands by the same person. And it's in Homer who, for the very first time, brings a composition to the realm of the gods which translates evenly with equanimity, with a transformational panache into art. Now, Homer, uh, regardless of what uh, uh, 20th century criticism says, wrote about 1000 BC, about 3000 years ago. He wrote at the end of a very highly literate period 
And that period uh, began somewhere around 3500 BC. So Homer was as far removed from the origins of an elegant, expressive civilization as we are from, from who? Who should we are you? Pythagoras. Pythagoras is as far from us as the origins of Sumerian civilization were from Homer. So you can see that he came not just fresh from the cave. <laughs> A lot of critics say, well, Homer couldn't have, have written his epics because there wasn't written literature. Well, hogwash. <laughs> there were thousands of years of written literature. Thousands. Like all the time from us to Pythagoras. And so Homer is very refined. But what he does initiate, what he is the originator of, is a way of composing experience so that the symbol of divinity, the symbol of gods, becomes able to be expressed in man's art. And one of the implicit uh, ebulences of this, one of the powers of the... Uh, of the magic vision of this is that man becomes capable of joining divinity in the very process of creation. Man's creative aspects becomes truly divine. And so in the ancient days, whenever Homer would be um, uh, depicted, one of the classic surviving friezes from antiquity, uh, that shows a number of levels. Uh, I think there are three or f there are four levels in this uh, fragment of a frieze. And in the top level, Homer is seated in a rather large, comfortable chair, and he's being crowned with the laurel wreath. He's being crowned with the symbol of divinity, of Apollo's divinity, to be uh, exact. The reason for this is that the art in the Iliad is composed in such a way that the entire work is balanced on a single center, but not a center that is in an ego, but a center which is in the expressive dynamic of the work of art. So that the Iliad is one of the world's greatest works of art and it's the first work of art that establishes that there was such an artist who was able to transfer completely his ego center to a work, which meant that he was able to give it up completely. And so Homer, like Shakespeare and uh, several other world-class artists, um, uh, Rumi, are those artists who are able to project out and transfer their ego center to a work of art so that the work of art has, to all intents and uh, purposes, a charismatic quality of centering all experience, all feeling, and all emotion in terms of the development of that work within the center of the work itself. And it gives the quality of an aliveness to a work of art. Uh, in terms of the Iliad, uh, there was a uh, British uh, critic named Wade uh, Geary, W.T. Wade Geary, who uh, wrote a thin little book on the Iliad one time, and he took all the trouble. He was educated at one of these British uh, schools at the beginning of the century where uh, they were painstaking in structure, and he outlined the entire structure of the Iliad and showed how all the events in the Iliad are paired. That what happens at the very beginning of the Iliad happens exactly at the very end of the Iliad, and as you move along through the Iliad, you also move back. And so at the very center of the Iliad is the initiating incident, the single, one, unifying, non-paired initiating incident 
and this incident is a death. And that death, the death of Patroclus, Achilles' friend, that death of Patroclus balances all of the pairs of action through the entire Iliad. Now this gives a very eerie aspect that if someone were to be able to, say, read through the Iliad at hypersonic speed, what you would experience in retrospect is that a pebble had been dropped into a psyche and all the concentric ripples of the pebble had made a kind of a ripple target on the surface of consciousness and that you had taken a straight line diameter through this concentric target of psychic ripples. And that's what the Iliad is. It is an amazingly great work of art, one of the greatest in the world. In 2010, when I make a film of the Iliad, it's going to knock their socks off. Bafo, they'll say. <laughs> Bafo Homer. <laughs> one of the qualities of the Iliad is that it demonstrates for the very first time how highly composed, that is to say compositional and also calm, the composed composure of experience adds to its integration, adds to its compactedness. And the more fine a structure, that is to say the more refined a structure is, in its composition. Its compactness in like corollary way gains in meaning and in power and intensity so that one can compact not only more experience but deeper aspects of experience. And a really great work of art like the Iliad takes all of the experience that was available at the time of the artist, all of the experience, in all of its levels and all of its depths, and so compacts literally the entire world into a single expressive vehicle, such that we who come afterwards can come to that work of art, and were we capable of developing ourselves to the scope and scale of Homer, we could reconstruct completely in our experience that world. I'll give you a, a little example of this. The other day I was in a, a bookstore and they were doing a reading and I, I was in the music section. I was trying to, to uh, find a copy of uh, one of our texts uh, for someone, a Poetics of Music by Stravinsky. And as I was there in the music section, I, I thought I was hearing, overhearing a poetry reading. And uh, after a little bit, the language sort of came to me and I thought, this guy is a very good poet. Who in the hell is this? And I walked over and there was a circle of rapt people. And not only was there one, but there were several readers and suddenly I realized that they were reading a play of Shakespeare's. <laughs> a very, very, very good poet, you see. <laughs> Once one has experienced an artist's realm, it leaves a quality of personal presence within our person so that we know who that is. We know that world and we can return to it at any time. And in this way, a civilization is remarkably different from a culture. A culture uses for its composition the ritual pattern, whereas a civilization uses for its composition the art pattern. Art makes civilization, whereas myth makes culture. So that we can say something terse like this that now will have some kind of discriminational meaning. Myth generates culture. Art creates civilization. Myth goes with ritual. 
Art expresses vision. Myth is a process. Art is an objective stage. Diametrical poles are not myth and art, but the diametrical poles are ritual and art. But there's a twist. That is to say, the line, the line of diameter connecting ritual and art, has in its middle a twist. This is where the transformation takes place. If the transformation takes place, in a prepared, concerted way, what comes out is the seed of your person. Whereas if it takes place in a more or less subconscious way, instead of a transformation, there's a transfer, just like the psychoanalytic notion of transfer. And what comes out is that the person who was teaching you is the big honcho. In other words, the difference between having a transformation and a transfer is the difference between building a democracy and building a list of suckers. Excuse the Hollywood language. Now I'll give a contrast uh, to this because it's very, very difficult to tell the difference. And the difference is so phenomenal in effect later on. I once in... Uh, is it was 30 years ago in San Francisco in 1965. I was doing uh, a lot of interviewing in San Francisco at the time. And I was uh, doing a, an interview between uh, two public philosophers at the time, Paul Goodman and Eric Hoffer. Paul Goodman was on the campus of San Francisco State at that time, and so he was available. And he was very famous at that time. Um, just uh, the, the author of novels and poetry and social criticism and philosophy. It was tremendous. Eric Hoffer was a longshoreman <laughs> who still hadn't become all that famous and who still lived in a little apartment down in the North Beach section of San Francisco and still drew retirement from his uh, days as being a, a, a longshoreman, a stevedore. When you went to speak to Paul Goodman, you had the overt sense that this was an extremely cultivated New Yorker, and he was. But gathered around Paul Goodman were just dozens of hangers-on. And he, wanting to blend in with the hangers-on, instead of wearing a suit and tie, which he would have in New York, wore gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants and um, the uh, uh, just beginning to be fashionable uh, tennis shoes. And he would talk shop, and the talk was about very powerful sociological ideas, very refined literary terms, but the way in which that talk took place, that is to say, the composition of the discourse detail was very much a cultural artifact and produced a set of believers in Paul Goodman's greatness. And almost none of those people became their own person. Whereas Eric Hoffer, when you went to visit him, you were all alone. There was almost never anybody around except just you. And he talked about ideas in such a way that it was impossible to be a believer. You went away with a critical attitude. Well, I don't know if, if his outlook is right or not. What, what was he saying to me? Well, I think I'll think about that myself. What Eric Hoffer produced was a circle of people who didn't realize that they were learning from him until later on they would meet each other in odd one-to-one -one combinations, seemingly at random, and recognize that he had spurred their thought on such deep, comprehensive levels that they became critically aware and intelligent, and a lot of those people went on to make a quality of civilization 
which is eventually going to obtain. We don't live in a completely um, uh, destructive age. Uh, there are a great number of people in the wings who have been doing fantastic work, and eventually it will obtain, and we'll have a, we'll have a wonderful civilization. It's really coming, and very fast. Paul Goodman became a mythic figure in the 1960s, in himself. Whereas Eric Hoffer was really a magician. He didn't look like a magician. Balding head, unfashionable glasses, plaid shirts when plaid was not it. <laughs> Thick fingers that were used to unpacking crates and stuff. Kind of gruff ways of doing this with his nose. But there was something incredibly vital about Eric Hoffer. Now, you can take a look at one of Paul Goodman's uh, books. Um, Growing Up Absurd was the most famous book in the 1960s. And if you take a look at a paper copy of Growing Up Absurd, you'll see how easy it was, how smooth it was to become a Goodmanite. But if you take a look at Eric Hoffer's book, The True Believer, written roughly at the same time, and roughly uh, occupying the same kind of quality in his work, you read Eric Hoffer's True Believer, and when you're finished, you put the book down and you notice your hand is trembling. As someone used to say, you realize that it's holy shit because we're really in that kind of fix. And the more you look around, you realize we have always been in this kind of fix. The true believer is about the charismatic leader who transfers his fever to millions who are ready to die for his cause. That is the emotional field which is there in the Roman Empire Imperium. That you be ready to die for the Caesar. Gladly. Now all of this surfaces not in politics. Yes, it's there in politics, but it's there in an argumentative cultural discourse, but it surfaces in aesthetics with all the clarity, all the vibrancy, all of the discriminating quality that you ever want to have. And so there's a tremendous relationship between art and politics. And in a way, politics is a regressive surrogate for the quality of personality which art really does express. This is why we can say some of the greatest stories ever told are the stories of the artistic David against the political Goliath. Because the artistic David, in some way, represents a truthful, real, storyline which has a penetrating quality of going into the hidden bedrock truth of the whole matter. So when we say myth generates culture, whereas art creates civilization, there's a difference between a generative quality the generative quality of experience. Experience generates. It most certainly does. But expression creates. And so we're always aware, at least on a glib level, that art is creative. But the creativity of art has to be given a capital C. Art is creative. What does it create? It creates civilization. And civilization is not a thing, but a process. It is art that is objective. 
It is art that has a stable stage, whereas civilization, rather, being, rather than being a thing, is another process. And this process, like all universal processes, has an objective phase that comes out of it. When we had nature, which was a process, the objective phase that came out of nature is ritual. What we do sticks. Remember the ancient Egyptian uh, theological conviction that once some action was done, it always exists within that time, within that day. Once Ra creates a day, that day exists forever. It's a part of eternity. So that Ra is the Lord of millions of years, built up by all the uh, 365 millions of days that make up a million years. So the conviction was somehow that heaven, eternity, is a foreverness that consists of everything that has ever been done within the limits of its day. And that as a new day is made, that new day is joined to that eternity, that foreverness of days that will never disappear. And if we are spiritually akin to Ra, if using the alchemical term, if we are psychically annealed to Ra's ability to pass through each day and make a new day, create a new day, we are then free to move between days like Ra and can then visit any day in eternity. We can go back in time as far as it ever goes. And we can go forward in time as long as Ra makes new days, which he will forever do. And so the realization was that once we are saved in that way, we are saved to visit the saved universe so that nature becomes objective through what we do, through ritual, which is why all the care about ritual, all early peoples, all traditional peoples, all cultural peoples pay attention to ritual. Everyone. There was a beautiful study done by a, a woman in Britain named Mary Douglas, who later did a book called Natural Symbols, but her early work was um, called uh, Purity and Taboo. And it was an anthropological study of British housewives and their housework, keeping the house clean, and the various things that they used and the rituals they went through to scrub and to all this purity and taboo showed that the British housewife was as ritual bound as any primitive native tribe. <laughs> <laughs> so that ritual is objective and comes out of the process of nature. Language, myth, is a process, and what comes out of that is the objective mind. Vision or magic is a process, and what comes out of that is the objective art. Civilization is a process that we call history, and what comes out of that is the objective cosmos. So that the cosmos is different from the universe in a remarkably clear way. The cosmos is objectively real, whereas the universe is a process that never is objective. There's all the difference in the world between the heavens and heaven. And what this educational process does is to take you on a infinite pattern Somebody was, uh, Bliss was pointing out how in Paul Clay's pedagogical sk sketchbooks that our little infinity sign is a part of the archetypal process of how perception actually works and how conception comes out of perception. 
and how composition always happens in this way. That there's a universal balance and that centering is not a process where one has to find the egotistical target quality of the bottom line. But one needs to do this conscientious sachet in such a way that you come to recognize the transformational central point that is indispensable that allows the ongoingness of the play and the creativity and the experience and the integration and the differentiation and that there is a transformational fulcrum that allows for that composition to occur in the first place. In the very first place. What first place? Below one at the zero place. Because on that zero foundation, then intelligence can find remarkably, intuitively exactly the right zero-based algorithmic structure by which one can then begin to consciously learn. And once one learns how to learn, once we know that, once we've mastered that, the universe is a boundless, fruitful, fertile field. And anything that you can imagine is possible. Anything. There are no limitations on us at all. If someone wants to describe doing this, is not making a halo, but showing there are no strings. As the author of the epistle to the Hebrews said to the congregation of the synagogue in Alexandria some 1900 years ago, he said, you are higher than the angels. For of which angels did he ever say, you are my family? The angels are bellboy messengers, whereas we're family. There are no strings. Myth generates culture. Art creates civilization. Myth goes with ritual. Art expresses vision. Notice that myth and ritual have what we would call post-Bucky Fuller a synergy. There's a synergy between ritual and myth. As soon as somebody does something, there is a primordial urge to tell something about, tell somebody what you did or tell something about it. I can remember as a uh, boy along the Gulf of uh, Mexico of uh, going out and having adventures. We would build rafts and go out to the uh, breakwater in Corpus Christi Bay and, and have these uh, pirate adventures and then come back and then watch the pale ashen faces of our parents and they say, well, we've been out on the Gulf of Mexico all day. And uh, it's this primordial Homeric quality that once somebody has done something adventurous, you want to tell other people about it. They haven't had the adventure. And so you tell them and you recreate the effect for them. And they are stunned in the way in which you were stunned. It's all of this quality. And I can remember in the sixth grade reading Homer in translation for the first time and, and thinking, my God, other men are not like my father just in, in business all the time and worrying about uh, papers and all this. Other men went out and did things. And how wonderful it would be to go out and do things. And I can remember the shock and surprise for the first time I told my father that. And he told me all the wild, wonderful, Homeric things that he did. <laughs> that he was the leader of a motorcycle pack in the 30s, and played uh, hockey for the Chicago Blackhawks, and was a trumpeter in a jazz band in New Orleans, and uh, was on the boxing team of the University of Illinois. And, uh, well, son, I hope that you have a good life. <laughs> you've got good genes <laughs> but with all that humility and with all that the point is that art has an incredible affinity with myth myth uses 
what we do as a fuel. And what we do is the fuel that spontaneously combusts and flames into language. Now, in the ancient yogic tr uh, tradition in India, if you would be apprenticed to a yoga master, say about uh, 2,800 years ago, the time of the Upanishads, say 300 years before the historical Buddha, when that prototype was first gelling, and the prototype was is that uh, the four-level caste system of the culture of the society at that time did not include any functional place for old men who could no longer work and who were infirm to such an extent that they were just going to be in the way. And so old men got into the habit of taking themselves into the hills, out of the fertile plains, taking themselves into the foothills of the Himalaya, there to complete their life of thinking about life and reality. And after a while, there got to be old men who lived for a long time in the Himalayas. And whenever there would be difficult periods in the culture, younger men would go to those older men to find out what they had found out. And that's how that whole guru situation began. The earliest rishis were of that nature. And they established that the only thing that you could take to a guru was fuel. And so when you read the Rig Veda, you find a lot of effervescence about all different kinds of sacrificial things. But when you read the Upanishads, you find that the only thing that you can take to a teacher is fuel. Now, the prosaic thing is that you think you take something fuel for cooking, but what you take, the only fuel you can take, is your experience. And your experience is largely limited to what you have really done. And what a yoga master used to do was to put you through a ritual way, like hatha yoga, or a karma yoga, or a bhakti yoga, or if you could stand it, a, a jhana yoga, so that you would become more and more simply aware of what your doing really was. You would reconstruct for yourself the actuality of what it is that you do do. And once having arrived there, that was the fuel upon which language could then combust. Then you could be taught then someone can tell you something. Because then you have the ritual fuel which flames into the hearing of that language. And for the very first time, what is the phrase that Aldous Huxley uh, used? Uh, the doors of perception. He took it from William Blake, who took it from Milton, who took it from... The doors of perception, once they are cleansed, we look with those wide owl eyes of Athena's symbol. And for the very first time, we see seeing. When we see seeing, there's a spontaneous recursive reality. When we see seeing, the seer exists. And that's why a wise person was called a seer. Seer. Not just somebody who's wrapped up in cultural seeing, held by all the ritual prototypes and habitual prototypes and stereotypes, but someone who independently sees that they are seeing. Then you can learn. And for the very first time, vision is possible. And out of that, out of that process, out of that creative cloud of beginning to really know comes the lightning of art.
and the lightning of art, then, kindles a different kind of a fire. Not a fire simply to cook food, but a fire to cook the universe into a cosmos, a creative fire. No angel is capable of that. There's never been an angel anywhere capable of cooking a cosmos. They're bellboys, not architects, is an architect potential. We can design the whole hotel if we need to. Can you imagine that? So queuing up to third-hand, fourth-rate metaphysics is rather an extraneous, thankless kind of a task. This education stresses that at this particular point, in this section of art, we can avail ourselves of the ability to have our own transformation rather than a transfer, and out of that to find that our hands hold our own lightning. You don't have to fear the lightning of Zeus. That was the message of Prometheus. Zeus doesn't dare throw a lightning bolt at some human being who can return it, catch it, and return it. Let's take a break. We need to cinch for ourselves a very powerful idea here. And in order to do this, to help us, I'm going to use a paragraph from a very uh, clear thinker. The man's name is uh, Alfred North Whitehead. And Alfred North Whitehead was um, one of the great geniuses at Cambridge University, beginning of the century. And he's the one that teamed up with uh, Bertrand Russell. And the two of them wrote that great three-volume work called Principia Mathematica. Now, there was an earlier Principia by Newton, Sir Isaac Newton. But this Principia by Whitehead and Russell forever cinched together the realization that the forms of logic and the laws of mathematics are identical and that intelligence by refining its ability to see this unity in composition was able in the 20th century to finally penetrate through the illusion of false elements. There was a time in ancient Western thought that the basic elements were like earth, air, fire, and water. And a great deal of effort by hundreds of millions of people over hundreds of years went into trying to understand the composition of what was real in terms of those elements. You can't do much on that, on that level. It wasn't until a friend of Benjamin Franklin's, Joseph Priestley, isolated oxygen that the very first real element in what turns out to be <coughs> the periodic table of modern chemistry was available. And once Priestley, who was incidentally a religious genius, he was like Benjamin Franklin, he could see directly. And when Priestley isolated oxygen, it was like a complement to Franklin's isolating lightning. Franklin caught one of Zeus's bolts, and he held it, and he looked at it and said, hmm, this is electrical energy. I think we'll save it. And he saved it in a thing called the Leyden jar. <laughs> and so when I was talking before about Zeus not daring throwing lightning bolts anymore, I meant it. How does... How did John Huston have Gregory Peck say it in Ray Bradbury's screenplay of Melville's Moby Dick? He said, Starbuck, you and I have rehearsed this scene a billion years before the sea ever rolled. <laughs> 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 
when you line up Melville and Bradbury and uh, Houston, uh, you've got uh, quite an alignment. So here out of the concept of nature uh, by Alfred North Whitehead, uh, the first paragraph of chapter 7 concerning objects. Elements are not earth, air, fire, and water. Elements are like oxygen, hydrogen, helium. And when you know this, and you know what those elements are, when you know the molecular and atomic structure of those elements, thanks to Dalton and Faraday and a whole bunch of other men who are temporarily dismissed, but will be remembered again, one notices an incredible truthfulness that the elements of the universe belong to families that they group themselves according to very distinctive families. All these elements have these kinds of ears and noses. These uh, elements have different ones. And so elements group themselves according to families. And that these families have a rising hierarchy. It's called the periodic table. And its periodicity is not in terms just of single elements, but of families of elements. And out of the eight families of elements that are there on the periodic table, one recognizes an ancient hermetic truth. At long last, one can see that the universe has no objective structure, but that its process of movement can be composed into a pattern. And once one understands that, then we can see that what we take to be objective, what we take to be solid, what we take to be things, are functions of this pattern. And so Whitehead writing here is a lecture he delivered uh, at the end of 1919, celebrating the end of the First World War, and it was a tremendous lecture series that he gave. Here's how it turned out to be in the written copy. The ensuing lecture is concerned with the theory of objects. Objects are elements in nature which do not pass. The awareness of an object as some factor not sharing in the passage of nature is what I call recognition. He's got little quotation marks around recognition. The reason why he does is because the English term recognition is a translation of the Greek term which Plato used some 2,400 years before Whitehead. Whitehead once uh, said all philosophy in the West is a footnote to Plato. The awareness, the awareness of an object, the awareness is not a factor sharing in the passage of nature is what I call recognition, awareness, recognition. It is impossible to recognize an event because an event is essentially distinct from every other event. Recognition is an awareness of sameness, but to call recognition an awareness of sameness implies you can do it, but one has to understand that when you do this, it implies folded up in it, you get this also with it. It implies an intellectual act of comparison accompanied with judgment. Comparison with judgment is wrapped up in talking about awareness as recognition. And that what we take to be objects are always things which are things primordially. Because what we are and what they are come into a paired sink. And only someone who is already there can tell there is something there. Takes one to know one. We have to be objective before we can understand or identify an object. 
which is why in a cultural, tribal situation, objectivity is not possible. It's not that they're primitive and so they're not objective at all. It's that that whole process, not being objective, has no way to identify objectiveness. The first anterior objectivity to existence is the mind. And one of the proofs of the mind's objectivity, I mean, there's such a thing today uh, that's studied by 20,000 new books every year is called cognitive science. Take yourself to a university bookstore and look at the cognitive science section next to the computer books. It's all about object recognition by mind forms. That's how computers work. That's how we work. Whitehead. But to call recognition an awareness of sameness implies an intellectual act of comparison accompanied with judgment. I use recognition for the non-intellectual relation of sense awareness which connects the mind with a factor of nature without passage. On the intellectual side of the mind's experience, there are comparisons of things recognized and subsequent judgments of sameness or diversity. Probably sense recognition would be a better term for what I mean by recognition. I've chosen the simpler term, recognition, because I think that I shall be able to avoid the use of recognition as a term in any other meaning than that of sense recognition. In other words, perception. I am quite willing to believe that recognition in my sense of the term is merely an ideal limit and that there is in fact no recognition without intellectual accompaniments of comparison and judgment. But, this is it, recognition is that relation of the mind to nature which provides the material for the intellectual activity. Now, this is very subtle. This, this is hard to get. It was so difficult that he wrote a book called Process and Reality that for about 40 years was all but unreadable by the most intelligent people on the planet. And Whitehead got a reputation as be, being one of the all-time great subtle intellectual thinkers until about 12, 15 years ago, someone realized that the printed copy of Process and Reality didn't match up with the manuscript and all sorts of editorial errors had been made. And part of the reason why, excuse me, the son of a bitch was unreadable was that it was unreadable. <laughs> Two generations of philosophy students. <laughs> the French have a lot of phrases for that. <laughs> when you look at the correct printing of process and reality, it's equally incomprehensible, but not because of bad editorial scrambling, but because it is so penetrating that one has to be able to relinquish all kinds of little pet theories that don't pro pass through the transformational process. Why? Because a lot of our convictions are actually beliefs which are inculcated by affinity to leaders, charismatic or other, that we have had in our lives that are conditioned thoroughly by habitual patterns of mental imperiums that go back several thousand years. And actually, it, free thought is a world that you have to enter in nude. You can't take one piece of clothing, hence the phrase, the wonderful phrase, popularized again by a great mathematician like Roger Penrose, the emperor has no clothes. Well, the emperor's new clothes come because you get a new trousseau, you get a new wardrobe. 
one that you pick out for yourself because you have a new mind. Penrose's book is called The Emperor's New Mind. The new mind is objectively real, but its objective reality identifies the elemental reality that's there in existence, but existence is what is being done. But notice that the process of nature is a happening. It's an unbounded happening, an unbounded doing. So in a way, the objectivity of ritual is real because it's doing parallels the activity of nature. Existence is real because it parallels nature. There's a paredness between our ritual doing and the doingness of nature. And while the doingness of nature can never be objective, our doingness is objective. And it's this way that nature, that the universe becomes what it is for us in respect of what we do. Now, when the mind becomes objective, it recognizes. <laughs> Ritual cognizes, but the mind recognizes that in a way, our ritual community, our tribe, our culture, our group that does all these things together creates a kind of a vessel, like a boat, that is able to navigate on the ocean of nature. And we can go wherever we want to go, as long as we learn to tack and sail and maneuver this vessel. That even though nature is a tremendous vast ocean, we're like ingenious Polynesians who have learned to navigate. But the only way to navigate, even though ritual makes the vessel, makes the boat, the navigation is done by the mind. Because only the mind can recognize patterns like the stars and use those patterns up there to navigate this here thing down here. Now, all of that as an ecology is what we would call and what everyone would call integration. That the integration of the real is this whole ecology of making this work. What is like a thumbprint in the eye of this integration is that as soon as there is a transformation, all of this integral process becomes complemented by an unknown, which is a differential process at least as extensive, at least as accurately extensive in depth and in scope to the integral process. But it's unknown. So the nature of consciousness is such that its differential potential is initially completely unknown. And that's why consciousness requires courage. If you don't have courage, you're never going to go. Never going to go. So that the, it's the easiest thing in the world to take a surrogate consciousness instead of making a transformation, just make a transfer. I'll use holy so-and-so's consciousness. They'll, they'll see us through. Big Honcho Cheese Company, he's going he's gonna to see us through. But what happens is that this is always a kind of a projected bubble that never really exists in the differential realm. It's only temporarily forced, like a bubble out of a pipe, only temporarily forced into that realm 
but it really belongs back in the realm of ritual. And so that bubble is always susceptible to control by somebody who controls the ritual level. Hence a Hitler. You don't have to be smart at all. There's such a catastrophic difference between the intelligence of a Thomas Mann and an Adolf Hitler that it's just laughable. Adolf Hitler was, what, a, what did Mort Saul one time say in one of his skits at the Hungry Eye? He, he called him a paper hanger. Because that generation used to call him a crepe hanger. There's nothing. And when you read the scathing commentary of a Thomas Mann, about the stupidity of this jerk, yet the jerk manages to almost embroil half the world in death, fears, and trauma. Why is that so? Because almost half the world is still living on a ritual level and very subject to this, and that there was no real transformation. There was only transfer. And so you get the phenomenon where people think that they are free, but they're only free in terms of borrowed images. Hence, at the end of the Second World War, one of the greatest of all intellectual geniuses at Harvard, David Reisman, wrote several books about individualism and freedom the lonely crowd. And he says in his introduction, he says in 1947, Americans seem to be satisfied with the images of freedom rather than seeking freedom itself. And this leads directly to the games people play, which are really subconsciously ritual, instinctual approximations and as soon as somebody clever comes along, what was that famous uh, 1970 uh, guy, Robert Ringer, winning through intimidation? <laughs> the louder the mouth, the more instinctual the blabber, the more weight you carry. And it causes all that bubble to be sucked back in and located again on the ritual level. So the origins of political tyranny are directly related to what we're talking about here. And if you want to read a really first class mind that lays it all out, Hannah Arendt in the origins of totalitarianism lays it out hundreds of pages by hundreds of pages. She or read her a volume of letters to Carl Jaspers that was just published last year. First class mind, determined to understand what happened, how do people do this. This is how it happens. This is why it goes on. And the only protection from this is to be cured from the condition. So that it turns out Jefferson was quite right. The only guarantee of uh, freedom is an educated populace. It's the only thing. It's an eternal problem. The place at which all of this becomes available for personal investigation is in this realm of art. So that art is extremely important to civilization. It's extremely important to the individual. The person, the civilization, the cosmos are all related together there at that juncture where art becomes objective. Now, somehow subconsciously, great religious tyrannies sense this, and they seek to put strictures upon the aesthetic limitations, for instance, in the Soviet Union, 
the Marxist-Leninist religion made sure in the 1930s by a philosopher named Plekhanov that there were certain guidelines for uh, aesthetic activity in the Soviet Union and no one transgressed those. The Third Reich had their culture police, the Roman Empire theirs, all great tyrannies on that level, all great binding, social binding tyrannies on that level. Their first objective is to make sure that the free creative artists are hushed up. They don't go to close the banks first. They don't go to hush the newspapers first. They muffle the creative artists first. Because instinctually, subconsciously, on this regressive, diseased pattern basis, they understand that if those bubbles are popped, they can't be sucked back into the ritual level. Because the bubble that pops goes back to the last objective level, which is not ritual, but the mind. And when you pop someone's bubble, they wake up they come to. And so in a way, in this struggle of titanic forces, the good guys against the bad guys, that's why everyone's searching for the needle in the haystack. All you need is one needle to pop that bubble. So let's finish up here by bringing some works of art up. This first one is a vision by an Eskimo woman. She was in her uh, 20s at the time that she did this. This is called Vision at Kuwata. Now, when you see this little uh, hut here, this little red hut, that's the Holman Island uh, group of Eskimos. Holman Island is up in the north of uh, Canada very far north. The Inuit people that we call Eskimos from the French, the Inuit people never had art until the 20th century. In the late 19th century, the first Inuit people to begin doing anything creatively with a pen were the women. And what they began doing was they began tattooing their faces so that the very first appearance of art in the Inuit people were the women tattooing their faces and the tattoos were increased as they aged so that when you would see an old Eskimo woman, you would see this tremendous complex face as if the whole cosmos of acupuncture points had been visualized on them. The first Eskimo artist was a woman named Kalvak. And Kalvak, if you see photographs of her in her old age, had this beautiful subtle web of tattooing on her face. The younger Eskimo women, the younger Inuit, no longer tattoo their faces because they have learned to express themselves in their works of art. And their works of art are largely in the form of these kinds of visual presentations, these kinds of prints, Eskimo prints. Almost all of the Eskimo print artists are women. 95% of the Inuit artists are women in this medium. The Eskimo men tend to make sculptures. They tend to do the carvings. And the earliest Eskimo carvings, the earliest Inuit sculptures, are not visual works, but they're works that are meant for a dynamic and kinetic handling. I uh, held one one time. And it was a sculpture that uh, you experienced by moving your thumb around it. So that inside the parka, 
by moving your thumb around, you would get this aesthetic experience of the composition, the pattern of the movement, the smoothness. It had to do with sensitizing the hand. Whereas the Eskimo women sensitized the eye. There's a very remarkable difference went together because the hand and the eye together have a primordial quality. Now this artist um, in her 20s, this is called Vision at New Wanda. The way to look at this is to look at it as a work of art because it's not a cultural artifact. It has nothing to do with the Holman Island Eskimos as a tribe. It has everything to do with the artist, with the woman herself. So that Kaluha here has she has seen this vision. Now when you look at it, you want to compose it. And the easiest way to compose it is to begin seeing it in terms of right and left, upper and lower. In other words, to pair the spaces. And in doing so, it's not so much that you draw a line and then have an upper and a lower. But you tend to see upper and lower together. How do they compare? Remember Whitehead. How do they compare? And then realize that the comparison is such and such, and that the comparison also is not such and such. And so the beginning of the appreciation is the beginning of seeing in terms of a balanced, paired, symmetrical structure of composition. And then you can do that for right and left as well as upper and down. And of course, once you have an up and down and a right and left, there's such a thing as a center and also such a thing as a frame. So there are three pairs, left and right, up and down, center and frame. Now, before you get to that kind of composition, before you get to composing geometrically with your eye, the important thing is to realize that the experience of the work of art precedes the mental structure. That before you even bring into play an ideational structure, a mental structure, a recognition, you want to just have a cognition. So the first way of seeing this is just simply to let your eye strike the work anywhere at all. What, what do you see first? And then wherever it is that you see, talk to yourself. What next do you see? What next do you see? And so you build up a sequentiality of your experience. What do you see first? What do you see next? Then where does your eye go? And from there, where does your eye go? And once you then have this kind of pattern, the sequential pattern of how you're seeing, go back and try to be aware on a little bit finer level, how does your eye move? How does your eye move from the beginning place to the next place, to the number two place? How does it move from number two to number three? And is that movement different from the first movement? And in this way, your experience begins to build up on a cognitive level, which is primordial. Why is it primordial? Because it's based upon this object. The ritual has already been made for your experience. This is it. Understand? The work of art initially is a ritual basis for your experience. And then once you have done that, then you bring into play this intellectual structure, this geometrizing, that was wrongly said, the um, geometrizing, this geometrizing pattern. And then you overlay those two together the pattern of how your eye moves and the relationality of how each movement is made. And then you reinterpret it in terms of the structure, the geometricity. 
so that you have a ritual basis in the work, you have your mythic structure of your experience, and you begin to talk about it to yourself. Then you interiorize it by joining that with the geometricizing structure. Then you take it through a transformation, because every work of art will go through a transformation. One of the things about a work of art is that it does not transfer, but it transforms. In other words, one of the elements in an aesthetic judgment is that the work went through the transformation and didn't just transfer. That's how you can tell, and by the way, it's the only way you can tell the difference between great propaganda and a crappy work of art. Even a junk level child's art will go through the transformation. But propaganda doesn't. Propaganda shows up as a transferal, because that's what its whole basis is. Not to transform, but to transfer. You're supposed to get their message in their way. You're supposed to respond to their message in their way. They control your response. That's the whole purpose of propaganda, folks. And without a propaganda, there can be no tyrannies. They just won't stick. You can see what bodhisattva work somebody does. Not by arguing against the tyrannies, not by super criticizing the telephone book of propaganda, but by undoing the loom that allows for those kind of structures to be done in the first place. Now, a work of art will go through a transformation and it will produce a vision of itself with you so that the viewer and the work of art together will be able to have a vision which is capable of being objectified and there is where the art is. That your experience of the work coming through that transformation is able to be objectified out of the vision. Now let's take a, a second work. I tried to find a, an example of uh, living art. This is by a friend of mine who uh, retired and went up to um, Cambria Bay, John Klopke. One recognizes this as a, uh, as a Christ, but it's actually a self-portrait of him. This is him. This is his self-portrait. Where does your eye go first? Where does it go next? Where does it go next? Now everybody will have their own way of seeing this work on a cognitive level so that we could out loud talk to each other and just describe how our eye moves. There would be a lot of similarity, probably at the beginning. There would be increasingly different paths, but there would also be increasingly different ways in which our eyes move from step to step, stage to stage. But then we would all be recollected together when it came to the geometricity, because the upper and the lower would be the same for both the right and the left, the center and the frame. So however disparate our own experience of this work would be, it would be refocused by the mind level, by the objectivity, so that the idea of this as a work of art is a recollecting point, and that's where the vision becomes recollection because of that. Because the symbolic level is an integral focus, but it's not a focus that's made initial. It's a refocus, a refocusing. So that a vision doesn't come out of a focus. An image is a focus. An image comes out of a refocus, which is a symbol. Symbol can refocus thousands of uh, images. In fact, 
what the way to talk about it is to say that a symbol refocuses the image base. However varied, wide, extensive the image base is, the symbol refocuses all of it together. And out of that refocus, vision is able to recollect, to recognize. And that's how an idea becomes, instead of just an amulet conserving meaning in a refocusing, it becomes a talisman which one can then use in a magical way to create not only a new vision of the world, but to create yourself. To create, eventually, a cosmos. The power of it is unbelievable. Compared to going on a shamanic journey uh, on a weekend away from the office, this is really big league stuff. Excuse me. Okay, let's come back for just a few minutes, and uh, then we'll, we'll take a break. We want to come back now to Art is Experienced by John Dewey. And we want to take a look. We can recognize now that there's quite a difference between existence and expression. And that part of what mediates in between existence and expression, part of the mediation in there, is a process that we would call experience, deepening. When experience deepens, it deepens in such a way that it has a particular relationship to nature. That is to say, the ritual level is always a selection of nature. And the veracity of ritual is that every element can be found in nature, in the process of nature. So when, let's say, a plain, Northern Plains Indian, like the, uh, uh, the Blackfoot or the Pygon, when they're doing a ritual, let's say like the Sundance, the Okan, at every stage of each of the eight days of the Okan, at each of each day, there has to be a certain cycle of ritual activities, and those ritual activities are not the province of any individual. Those ritual activities are the province of groups. They're called on that level, uh, the English term is societies. So, for instance, in the uh, Blackfoot Nation, two of the men's societies, one of them is called the Eats Kinaye, which is the Buffalo Society. And these are the power men. They have these large staves that are curled at the top and look like croziers. They have the power of bishops, in a way. And when the Eats Kinaye comes out, they they're like scary because it's like raw, masculine group energy. And what it's meant to do is just simply to disrupt the normal pattern of life. As Zorba says, it's time to undo our belts and cause trouble. <laughs> Whereas another men's society, the Prairie Chicken Society, is meant to induce the sense of infinite play that's just as important as the scary, mysterious power of the Buffalo Society. It also is a province of the men. So at the Prairie Chicken Society, they take their ritual movements and their ceremonial ornaments, they take them from the habitat of the Prairie Chicken. They get hunched down and they wiggle their butts with feathers on their butts so that you get this kind of uh, comic motion where the eats kinai are they're concerned with like the horns and the stare right and the power symbol the one group of men is meant to disrupt ordinary life the other group of men as a complement is meant to to show that ordinary life can take these disruptions. Mother Nature puts up with disruptions all the time. 
If you guys are through yelling, if you want some food, you better make it yourself because we're pissed off. That kind of attitude so that the wholeness of the societies fits together so that the ritual level includes a completeness, a whole sphere of life. So that there are women's societies. And one of the women's societies has to do with initiating young girls into womanhood. That's tucked into this particular day while the men are bifurcated into goofing around or into power plays. The women then use that opportunity to initiate the girls into full womanhood, right? What better time when they're busy <laughs> will tell you how to work this? Now that whole ecology of that day fits in with many other days that are there in that society. Pattern. That pattern of those societies are what make that ritual event, the sun dance, happen. But the entire sphere of that sun dance is limited to the mythic level, is annealed to the ritual level, has a capacity of being symbolized for sure, and is symbolized. Those people are not stupid. They do symbolize it. But being not stupid, they know they can't go any further because they're all a part of the ceremony. They can't go any deeper than symbols. And so somebody in the tribe has to be an ex officio member of the sun dance. And that's the holy woman. She's the one who is in charge of the sacredness of the whole tribe during that event. And she's not a part of the ritual, not a part of the myth. She's not a part even of the symbolism, though she controls a lot of the symbolism. She's outside of that whole sphere because she is in the vision. She holds the vision in her little hut alone. And as long as she holds that vision, that Sundance has no worry, power, of entrapping people in some kind of subtle or not so subtle tyranny. It is her guarantee that she maintains the vision and she has the vision because she went through the transformation in midwinter. And part of her thankfulness to Grandmother Spirit that she was able to go through this suffering transformation in midwinter is that she guarantees that she will maintain the vision for the sun dance, for the whole tribe. And were there not a holy woman who could do that, there would be no efficacy to the sun dance whatsoever. It would simply be a tourist attraction, simply be a habitual rut. But as long as the holy woman maintains herself in a differentiated vision outside of the tribe, that sun dance then is holy. It's not holy because of the ritual level. It's not holy because of the myth level. It's not even holy because of the symbol level. But it's holy because she, being transformed, guarantees it from the other side. And she adopts as her son the one young man who at the end of all of the ritual activity takes himself into the Sundance Lodge and from the Sundance Pole all these rawhide uh, uh, straps are hung down, a pair of them, and they're tied around a little bit of horn that's sharpened so that it's like very, very sharp teardrop shapes of bone. And these are stitched into his shoulder flesh. And he's given a bone of a, an eagle that has a little hole of tapped into it so it sounds like a shrill whistle. It sounds like a, the beginning of a panic baby scream. And that's the only sound he's allowed to make, is to blow that panic baby scream whistle from the pain. And he has to pull himself free by allowing patches of himself, a pair of patches of himself, to be ripped out. 
And he can only do that because he is guaranteed that he is the son of the holy woman during that whole period. And that she will take his spirit through that transformation. And that when she takes his spirit through that transformation, he will take the dedication of the whole tribe's spirit through that transformation. That she has gone through and maintains herself is paired up with his ability to go through trusting that she did. And their tandem meeting carries the whole tribe into sacredness. That's the way it works, folks. That's the way Ice Age men and women understood that you keep the tribe supernatural because if it remains on the tribal level, there's only endless warfare and no vision. We cannot afford to uh, forget that. Now, when we come back next week, we're going to take a look at two great new artists. We're going to look at Henry Moore in sculpture and Frank Lloyd Wright in architecture. I'm going to take uh, about 20 minutes to show you a series of slides of Henry Moore's work. And what's central in Henry Moore's work is the holy woman. The woman figure who is able to dissolve herself away from this world and recreate herself in a what we would call a transcendental world. That is to say, she dissolves her materia into spaces so that her reality bridges with equanimity the world of spaces and the world of materia so that material and space become equanimous. And Henry Moore in this way shows us what the Holy Woman is all about. Frank Lloyd Wright takes the house and dissolves the tyrannical structures of the house so that the space of living becomes as real as the so-called walls and windows, floors and ceilings. And when the house is equanimous between the space of living and the material of expressing its space and building, when the living space and the objective stuff of the house are equal, then we have a place in which sacred man could live. Now, all of this is important at the very center of the juncture of art. In order to help us, you need to do two things. One is that your projects of doing sculpture are important now to simply keep at, keep doing. Make a sculpture if you haven't already. Bring it to class and give it to somebody else to redo. This whole involvement of the hands at this point is extremely uh, important. The ritual of doing something with your hands is very, very important. And at the same time as you're making a sculpture to bring in, to show what you did, and then pass that to somebody else and they're going to remake that, and somebody else is going to remake that. At the same time of that project, everyone's making a painting. Everyone's working on a painting. Do at the end of the art thing. Do two months from now. The painting is a personal process of individual expression. Whereas the sculpture is a commutative, or I almost use the mathematical term, uh, uh, commutative activity of experience. So that experience and expression come together, neither obviating the other, but they come together, together hopefully in such a way that it's like two hands that are able to be held up. And in this way, when we can do this, and it becomes a part of our life, like having learned to ride a bicycle or having learned to type, when this becomes like a subconscious relational tapestry in our life, 
the spirit becomes free. And everything in nature, everything in language, everything in vision, spontaneously reveals what it is. This is how the cosmos really happens. The cosmos really happens when someone is able to look anywhere and everywhere and not only see what it is, but understand what it is and express what it is and join with living it as it is. So the cosmos is actually a living, conscious universe. That's one of our texts, the conscious universe. The cosmos is conscious. And when we realize that it's been conscious forever, we realize that uh, we're following, what did they have to say? The pattern laid down a billion years before these photons ever rolled. More next week.